So as you can imagine, we're having a lot of fun around our house these days. So thankful to have the Bentleys with us and going to be with us for quite a while. And so we're excited about that. It was a beautiful, wonderful night last night. Uh, this place was filled with many friends and visitors and family members. And just thankful to everyone who had a part in making it happen, especially Alan and his leadership. Uh, so I know many good seeds were planted last night. That's great. So a certain Texas rancher had a pair of cowboy boots made that turned out to be a little too tight. And the bootmaker insisted on putting them on the stretcher to stretch them out, but the rancher would not allow him to do that. And he explained to the guy why he didn't want them stretched. He said, there is little in my life that is pleasurable. Every morning I get out of bed and I have to go get the cows that got out overnight and fix the fence that they broke to get out. And then all day long I watch as my ranch blows away in the dust. After supper I listen to TV talk about how high the price of feed is and how low the price of beef is. And my wife is always nagging me for us to move into town. So when I get ready for bed every night... I want to look forward to the only pleasure I have had all day. The pleasure of taking off these boots that are killing my feet. Because they're too tight. <laughs> Very few of us would put up with a life that is that devoid of pleasure, right? Just think about the place that pleasure takes in our modern lives. Now, there's always been pleasure in life. There's always been things that we've enjoyed, whether it be songs or jokes or stories or games. But today, pleasure has become almost the entire goal of daily life. Today, we expect our work to be pleasurable, a lot more than any of our ancestors did. In our day and time, if it isn't fun, we don't want anything to do with it. That's our modern sensibilities, right? So in our modern culture and society, we have more leisure time and more money to spend on pleasure than any other time in history. Kyle Eidelman writes, People spend trillions of dollars every year trying to make themselves happy, whether it's with food or various forms of entertainment media, with travel, drugs, or drink, or with one of the countless other items that promise to turn your frown upside down. Now, you might be thinking, what surplus time? I'm busier than I've ever been. And that may be true, but what are you busy doing? Quite often, the answer is chasing pleasure. Or you might be thinking, what pleasure my life has been and is devoid of any pleasure? But if you haven't experienced much pleasure, you can probably remember a time when you have, and you want more of that. And thus begins the quest for the elusive narcotic of pleasure. In our sermon series, Counterfeit Gods, Defeating the Idols that Battle for Our Hearts, so far we've learned that idolatry is a problem, even in our own day. Because an idol is anything that takes the rightful place of God in our lives. And this is a challenging series. I appreciate Tom being honest about that. It is challenging for us to be looking at our own hearts and lives. Last week we learned that God is a jealous God, and He is jealous for us. But this is a good expression of His right love for us. This is a protection for our well-being. With today's sermon, we begin to investigate the specific counterfeit gods that battle for our hearts. And, and I'm borrowing from Kyle Eidelman's book, Gods at War, will for the most part use his kind of outline of the different kinds of idols. He's done a nice job of organizing them. And, and those, that outline has three headings. There, there's the temple of pleasure, there's the temple of power, and there's the temple of love. And under each of those temples, there's different counterfeit gods. So we're going to start today with the temple of pleasure. And in the temple of pleasure, there is the god of food, the god of sex, and the god of entertainment. Now, there's many other gods in there, but these are the ones that we, I think, most are likely 
to struggle with and bow down to. Now, let me make something absolutely clear. And you're going to hear me say this so many times in this series, you're going to get tired of it. All the things that become counterfeit gods, including food, sex, and entertainment, are not sinful or evil in and of themselves. In fact, all these things have the potential to be good gifts from God that draw our hearts to God. But they can be turned into counterfeit gods when we mishandle them. So as we move from the general topic of idolatry into specific counterfeit gods, like the one we're going to discuss today, the god of food, we move from the abstract into the concrete. And as the old saying goes, we move from preaching to meddling. You might be interested in knowing that uh, I have given one whole sermon to the subject of our relationship with food in my 34 years of preaching. It was in 1996. I preached a sermon on gluttony that I called To Hell on a Cream Puff. <laughs> Guess I was a little more radical back in my youth. <laughs> How many of you remember the animated movie called Over the Hedge? Some of you like this movie, some of you may still watch it from time to time. This innocent animated comedy provides a good illustration for us, a, a good starting point for our discussion of the god of food. This movie is about a group of animals that move from the woods to the suburbs because of food, right? R.J. the raccoon made a discovery. Human beings who dwell in the suburbs are bottomless pits of food. R.J. explains to the other animals, we eat to live, but humans live to eat. R.J. tells his friends if they just hang around the hedges, there'll always be something to eat. He offers to show the animals this. And so they follow him to peek in on a human family. R.J. explains to them the human mouth is called the pie hole and that people are called couch potatoes. He explains that telephones are devices for summoning food. He says, watch. And a human picks up the phone. They make a phone call. And a few minutes later, here comes the pizza delivery man. RJ continues to explain to them, humans bring the food, take the food, ship the food, drive the food. He points to the passing trucks, and there's pictures of food on the trucks. It seems that everything people do involves food. And as the family Prays at the dinner table. R.J. explains, this is the altar where they worship food. <laughs> and then he points to the treadmill and explains, that gets rid of the guilt so they can eat more food. <laughs> now, obviously, there's some tongue-in-cheek in this humor, right? And yet, it's not that far off base, is it? Think for a minute about the role that food plays in our lives. Think about the American diet. Statistics from 2015 show that Americans spent, listen to this, $208 billion a year on fast food. $208 billion a year on fast food. In 2015, Americans spent $7.5 billion dollars on potato chips. And the USDA says that potato chips are the most eaten form of potatoes in the American home. Hmm. According to the American Center for Disease Control, 68% uh, of Americans are overweight, one-third of Americans are obese. The average American consumes two to three pounds of sugar a week. And 100 years ago, when heart disease and cancer were rare, the average person consumed five pounds of sugar per year, not two to three per week. It's hard to argue that the god of food is less than a central power in our country. But in all fairness, the god of food is an equal opportunity god. And so it's not just those who are overweight that struggle with the counterfeit God. 
a person can have a strong metabolism and look very fit, and food could still be their God. Food can also be a God when we're consumed with diet and exercise. A a person can build their life around organic, healthy foods, and they might still be building their life around the counterfeit God of food. Even if we might argue at least it's a more healthy God, right? Nevertheless, it's a God who can demand an incredible sacrifice of time and money, a God that specializes in vanity and pride, a God that encourages us to worship our own image or to take credit for our good health. See how good stuff can just get twisted? Now, let me emphasize again the fact that food is not bad in and of itself. In the Bible, food is mostly treated as a gift from God. I think this is supposed to be a beautiful picture of of the food that God gives us. So just kind of imagine that. The computer decided not to show it. Probably over there if you want to go look at it. But anyhow. So God created us with bodies that require food for our nourishment and survival. And in the Bible, food is mostly treated as a gift from God. Now, God could easily have made the fueling process more cut and dry, right? Think about it. It could have been like, just like gasoline in the car. The car doesn't crave the taste of gasoline, you know? It could have been just like that. Oh, need a little energy, need a little nourishment. Boop, there it is, done, move on. Instead, God clearly wanted eating to be an enjoyable activity. He created a vast spectrum of foods and flavors. He gave each one of us 10,000 taste buds so that we could have high-definition tasting. And so eating is meant to be a blessing. But the problem is every gift God gives us can be twisted into something to lure us away from him. Let's think for a minute about the way the God of food works. Let's imagine walking into one of the, the food God's favorite temples. I'm glad we got this picture. The Cheesecake Factory. Now, please, hear me again. There's nothing wrong with the Cheesecake Factory or other restaurants in and of themselves. But this is a good example for us to think about the way this might work and how the whole thing is designed and marketed to get us into trouble. Now, this restaurant is not designed for bodily sustenance and nutrition, right? It's all about satisfaction. And the menu and its offerings are all about throwing a big party for our taste buds. And for the few minutes that we dine there, All is right with the world. And it's a piece of heaven. Think about for a minute the way we often talk about eating and heaven, right? This cake is heavenly. Or this pie is to die for. Or I love soul food. Or this is really comfort food. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. This is the nectar of the gods. Now, let me again make it perfectly clear there's nothing wrong with eating at the Cheesecake Factory and that it is not idolatry to enjoy a good meal. The problem begins when we start to look to food to do for us what God alone should do for us. Instead of turning to God, how often do we try to treat a troubled life or troubled soul as if it were a growling stomach? Kyle Eidelman wrote, When the going gets tough, the tough get chewing. Frank Farrell wrote, A a very large part of mankind's ills and of the world's misery is due to the rampant practice of trying to feed the soul with the body's food. 
Let's consider some of the ways we give ourselves over to the God of food to, to bring meaning into our lives. First of all, some people look to the God of food to give themselves a feeling of control. A feeling of control. Succumbing to the desire to overeat may be a way some people demonstrate power and control. Our lives can be so complicated. There's so many things about the world and our experience that are out of our control. We can't make others do what we want them to do. We can look at that chocolate pie and say, I'm going to show you who's boss, right? So it's a way of exerting control in, in, in a time when we feel our world is out of control. Now, interestingly enough, the opposite problem Undereating, or what we call anorexia, actually comes from the same root desire to demonstrate power or control. I can't control other things in my life, but I can control what I eat. And they attempt to bring order and control by not eating at all. And you know the devastating effects of that. Now, secondly, some people look to the God of food to give them an escape or a distraction. And this is probably, if, if I fall into one of these, it's probably more like this one, right? Maybe you are too. The constant stream of pleasant eating sensations, well, they can cover up the trouble that we have in our lives or keep us from more troubling activities that we don't want to do, whether it's self-examination or something else. That box of chocolates is much more pleasant than self improvement and self-assessment or other hard things that we don't want to do. One minister says, when people ask me why God seems so distant, I ask them, how much junk food have you been eating? How much TV have you been watching? Food can be a great escape and a bomb for what hurts. Number three, some people look to the God of food to give them insulation or an outer protection from harm. Maybe you never thought about it this way. For some people, compulsive eating is linked to a desire to get larger because they're afraid of being thin or small. Some people, because of the abuse they've experienced in their lives, may equate being thin with becoming an object of sexual attraction. And that's something they're trying to avoid at all costs. For others, because of the abuse they've experienced, the bigger they can get, the greater the feeling of safety or power for protection. One cartoon showed an enormously large man looking into a refrigerator, and a smaller man stood by holding up that finger of, ad, uh, of admonition saying, you are what you eat. And the larger man replied, good, that makes me omnipotent. The larger I get, the stronger I feel, the safer I feel. So all of us need the sense that life is not out of control. All of us need the comfort from our fears and our pains. All of us need a sense of protection and safety. The question is, where are we going to look for that? Are we going to look to the God of food, or are we going to look to God the Father? Let's turn to the Gospel of John. Consider for a, moment, uh, for, for a moment this moment in the ministry of Jesus when food became his competition. We're all familiar with the time that he fed the 5,000, right? And the number of men was 5,000. That didn't include women and children. So the number was even much bigger than 5,000. It had been a long day. They were far from home. They needed something to eat. And so Jesus miraculously fed them with five barley loaves and a couple of fish, and yet everyone ate and were satisfied. Jesus used that opportunity as an object lesson, right? He wanted them to see the need to satisfy their soul's hunger more than to satisfy, satisfy the hunger of their bodies. He wanted to help people to learn to hunger and thirst for righteousness. He wanted them to discover the truth of what he taught about in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, it is not life more than food. It is not life more than food. So after everyone had their fill, Jesus dismissed them. He made his way to the other side of the lake. Well, when the crowds that Jesus had fed woke up the next morning, 
and yesterday's feast was digested, and they were hungry again, they began looking for Jesus, figuring surely he's open for breakfast, right? He was open for dinner last night. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, here's what Jesus had to say to them. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. And he told them, all you need to do is believe in me. And I have to laugh at their response to him. They said, you should give us a sign so that we can believe in you. And in case you can't think of a sign, maybe a really good sign would be for you to give us some bread. Kind of like when Moses gave the bread to God's people. And they even quoted him some scripture. They definitely had bread on the brain. And Jesus explained to them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And with those words, he was explaining to the crowd, though they hadn't realized it, that he is the real bread they need. They'd come wanting some bread for their stomachs. He was the bread they needed for their souls. He's the bread we need for our souls. And the question each one of us needs to wrestle with is, do we really believe Jesus is the bread of life and that our real hunger and thirst can only be satisfied in Him? Because if we try to satisfy those hunger and thirsts, we end up running to other gods. Have we learned and experienced Jesus' promise, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Have we taken the psalmist up on his challenge in Psalm 34? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have we understood what Jesus understood when Satan tried to tempt him into making the bread when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God? Have we come to have the mindset that Jesus had when he said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Has the God of food taken our attention away from the real God who is the bread of life? Let's finish up the lesson by asking ourselves some questions Help to identify if our relationship with food is in line with a right relationship with God. Question number one, do I eat more for pleasure or for nourishment? Why do I eat what I eat is a good question. Is it mostly because of pleasure or mostly because of nourishment? Again, there's nothing wrong with finding pleasure from a gift that God has given When we pursue pleasure for its sake, it has a way of expanding beyond its borders and taking over. Question number two, when and why do I overindulge? Does the word comfort food really describe the reason that you eat? Do I use food as a salve for my daily hurts? When things in my life are going wrong, is my first impulse to reach for food. Do I use food as a reward? After a long day at work, I deserve a Big Mac on the way home for dinner. After a long day, is that big bowl of ice cream at the end of the day my reward for making it through another day? Question number three. Am I able to exercise Holy Spirit-given self-control? Can I enjoy a slice of pizza? Or do I have to consume the whole pizza? Can I enjoy a piece of chocolate? Or does it have to be the whole bar, or the whole box, or the whole bag? 
One of the easiest ways to gauge the power that the God of food has over us is to do some fasting. And I know diabetics and other people with health problems have to be very careful about this, but how hard would it be for you to fast from a single meal? Or to fast for a day? Or two? Or just to fast from certain foods? for a period of time. And I'm not suggesting that as just a way to test discipline or control, and certainly not suggesting as a way to lose pant size, but as a way to draw near to God. A way to experience a hunger for God that is greater than this relentless demand of our stomach to try to bring some control and understanding. I want to end with a point that uh, Keitel Eidelman makes as a devotional thought, kind of at the end of his, of his chapter on this subject. I put it in the bulletin because I thought it would be a good thing for you to have to, to meditate on a little longer. He writes, idols are defeated not by being removed, but by being replaced. The God of food promised us to feast, but we came up empty. He invited us to consume until it consumed our lives. We wasted everything, or we tasted everything until nothing had taste anymore. And so finally, we came to Jesus. We discovered He offers the one true feast. He fills our every need. Every hunger ultimately leads back to Him. David wrote, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Jesus frees us from an abusive, dysfunctional relationship with food because He is our portion. And in Him we discover what we are searching for all along. (coughs) If we seek our joy and meaning in food, then the source of our joy always disappears and always must be found again. A consumable God. It's different with Jesus. Nothing tastes better than the joy and satisfaction of knowing Christ. Nothing nourishes the soul as He does. Nothing feeds and strengthens and renews us like the time we spend with Him each day. He feeds us. I'm sorry. He bids us to take and eat. He bids us to come to to the well where He offers living water so that we may never thirst again. Think of a time when you've come in from the hot, sun drenched with sweat, with a parched throat, and you downed a cool glass of ice water. Did anything ever taste better? Such a moment is more than a vague hint of what it feels like to be spiritually starving and to be given the bread of life, to have a thirsty soul and to drink deep from His living water. And ironically, it is only when we find our meaning in Christ when He takes the throne of our lives, that earthly food recovers its taste, its delight. In its right place, food is a great gift from God. So, the God of food, our relationship with God the Father. I I pray that this has given you some some food for thought, some food for the soul. May God bless each one of us as we do this hard work of making sure that God is in the rightful place and that everything else is in the right place in response to God.